I got sick for seven years and I lost everything. And I had to start again at 50 with nothing. No house, no mortgage, no savings, no pension, nada. I had to work very, very fast for the last 10 years. But while I was getting better from being sick, I also went round a sort of loop in my head where I taught myself, I retrained as a coach in the last few years, became an NLP master practitioner, hypnotherapist, all that sort of stuff. And I'd also, in my younger years, been fascinated by a thing called the Tao of Physics, written by Fritjof Capra, 1975. It was about how Eastern mysticism and Western physics were merging in terms of our understanding of consciousness and so for many, many years I've been studying that and of course now this is very much part of the common dialogue. Consciousness is actually being proved as something relevant. So you'll see on my little write-up it says I occasionally use bonkers interventions and it's because I've got some of this random thought field therapy, NLP and commercial stuff. On the commercial side I've also since getting back into the workplace continued to grow the business that I had to give up because I was told I would never work again. And then I became a CEO of other people's businesses for a while and I grew them and they sold them and they made money and I carried on working and I've been a business advisor, I'm a serial non-executive director and I work across a whole area, range of sectors like IVF and financial services and headhunting and music publishing and business is just business is just business. But what I can tell you is that when I was sick and when I was getting better from being sick, and when I lost my marriage, and my health, and my business, and my money, and my self-esteem, the thing that got me up every morning, and that rebuilt me time after time after time, was and is work. My reality is that I work. I love working, and I think we were built to work, and I intend to work forever until they nail the lid down. I'll probably be still there pressing up saying, let me out to do something. That's my reality. And if I didn't have to work until I die, because I have to earn money, I probably would anyway, because I can't see why I would end up not using up whatever talents I have. What's your reality? Well, a lot of you here are considerably younger than me. I mean, I'm a mother, grandmother, all of those things now. It's quite frightening, actually, when you say you're a mother and grandmother. When did that happen? <laughs> um, most of you are younger than me, and you will live longer. You'll live into your 80s. Many of you will live into your 90s. You may retire at some time. You very probably won't. Some of you may make a fortune. Most of you will make a living. Some of you may marry or cohabit, and that person may or may not be able to support you in the... Uh, manner in which you wanted to be accustomed. The marrying, cohabiting, having someone else look after you, I binned that years ago. Well, it binned me first and then I binned it right back. You know, even do that sort of revenge binning thing. If you don't want me, I definitely never wanted you. Um, my mother, who was born in 1907 and died when she was 90, was way ahead of her time and she always said to me, never let a man buy you a house or a car. Always be able to put a roof over your own head and be able to get in the car and get the hell out of there if you have to. And I sort of have stuck to that mantra, not deliberately. When you get forced into things, you start to assume that that's the way you were thinking anyway. Um, you may end up working forever, but you will also, God willing, be healthier than ever people have been in the past. You won't necessarily end up dribbling in a care home corner, which is lucky, because the care home corners are getting more expensive and scarcer than ever they were. You know? so, so that's good. So you're going to be around for a while. Someone said earlier, life is too short. I think it was Michelle who did that amazing talk at the beginning. I actually think life is too damn long not to get it right and not to get in control of what your life is about. We can spend so much time somehow thinking, I've got to cram all this in and I'm not going to expand and do all of this stuff. Life is too long not to just take a breath now and again and work out, am I using all of me? And for me, work is how you get that control. Work is freedom. Work is about saying, I can be independent. I can weave in and out of life as it happens to me because life is going to happen to you as well as you're going to happen to life. Work for me is about becoming the person that I was sent out here to be and unpacking all the Russian dolls of all my talents because 
most of the stuff that I do now, I actually was never trained to do. I learned to do it as time went on. Or I stumbled across something and I had to do it and I thought, oh, hello, I'm good at that. Or someone noticed, oh, hello, she's good at that. Get her to do that. And you build up this battery, an army of things, and this business of working and learning new stuff is so fabulous. And when you think of little children growing and developing, the sheer joy they get when they ride that bike for the first time and they get the stabilizers off. And, and the Olympics and the Paralympics, when you watch people succeeding, success is orgasmically good. It's the most amazing thing in the world. There is nothing like self-gratification. Well, the ability... <laughs> Some of you are ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> our ability to please ourselves by trying something that we didn't know we could do, didn't know we could achieve at, and to be able to do it is one of life's great pleasures of being a human being. Along with love and along with sex, our ability to seek and strive and struggle to give ourselves pleasure is what makes us human. It's what keeps us alive. And when people stop doing that, the light starts to go out. So this is about keeping your light going. Now, the other thing I think about women, I try not to make gender stereotypes. I hate them. I usually stereotypically <laughs> and in stereo complain quite a lot when people try and stereotype people. But we all know women can change their minds, so hell. Um, <laughs> I think that women are naturally flexible of mind and flexible of talents. I'm not saying that some men aren't, but I'm saying that women in general, we tend to be a bit more weavy, <coughs> accepting, flexible about what we do. And that flexibility of talents and minds is what allows us to be able to turn ourselves to so many different things. Because in the course of a woman's life in particular, you have to keep adapting to the time that you are young, free and independent, and then perhaps when you're a mother, and then perhaps when you're a carer, and then perhaps when your children are teenagers and they need a different focus from you, or your partner needs more help. And we do this constant reconfiguring of how we get through life and how we make a living, because I do work in the principle that nobody is going to look after me financially for the rest of my life. I'm it. I'm going to have to do that. So I have to work out how to do that all the way through the next, I'm, I'm going for next, another 30 years or so. All right, 30 years is OK. Think about it. I'm 60. I started work when I was 21. 30 more years. I better get good at something. <laughs> what we've been doing for the last 30 to 40 years, I think, is we've been sleepwalking through life. Somewhere around the 70s, someone said that, or they projected that we would have so much leisure by this time that we would all just be thinking, oh, God damn it, what do we do now? You know, three day weeks, down the gym all the time. It's not happened, it's not gonna happen. There are no pensions, it's all gone. Don't know who spent it. Too many old people, we can't kill them all in time. So we're gonna have to all work. But what we've been bombarded with, and I'm only talking about women here because this is TEDx and this is about women, but it's actually true. What women have been bombarded with for the last 30, 40 years plus, is basically sex. Lots of sex. Joy of Sex, that book in the 70s, many, any of you here old enough to remember it? The illustrations alone were a perfect contraceptive. <laughs> it was just horrendous, that hairy man. Wowzers, it's still engraved in my mind. Um, the pill, of course, the pill came along. And then we got all the other stuff. So we've had cosmopolitan sex in the city and, and all this stuff. And even now, if you walk out and you look at any of these billboards, we have been and are con constantly bombarded by sex. Now, I like sex. I would like to state this quite clearly now. And if any nice, cool guys out there are watching this, I like sex. That's fine. <laughs> but the thing that is going to give you freedom is work. The thing that is going to give you independence is work. But we've got the language of sex. We've done that. We know that. We've decoded sex. I have a daughter. She's 34. She's successful, fulfilled. She's happy. She's secure. She's dynamic. She's also very sexy. And I was sort of looking at her thinking, wow, you're going to have to work for an awful long time, Sunbeam. It's lucky you're good at it. And then I thought, well, if we know this language of sex so well, how could we use that to use it as a form of reminder for us about how we approach work. So how could we use the language of sex 
to basically give us a language for reinterpreting how we do work. And I thought, how do you take, where do you go with that one, Avril? Do you ever get these little thoughts sometimes and you think, okay, I don't know where I'm going with that one. Um, and you sit around for a while. So I looked around my bookshelves. I have a lot of books. I have a very small flat and it would stand up entirely on its own just by the books. And I looked around all the books and on my shelf, I had a copy of the Kama Sutra, research purposes only. <laughs> it had been there for years, honestly. I hadn't really looked at it before. And uh, I picked it up and I started reading it, and clearly I had only ever looked at the pictures before, because I definitely had not read this lot before. But right at the beginning of the Kama Sutra, they actually say that a woman should have a list of supplementary skills and jobs that she can do so that if she is, and I quote, in distress, even in a foreign country, she can support herself by utilisation of these skills and doing these jobs. And this is not blowjobs we're talking about, this is job jobs. <laughs> and the list was interesting. <coughs> Culinary skills, now that's, that's not that interesting. So a woman can cook, you can earn money as a cook, that's fine, I can buy that, that's terrific. Fixing things around the house, now little, doing little fixing things around the house, they actually mentioned it and I thought, ooh, no one's ever seen me with a level <laughs> and a drill, it's probably not good, but I can understand that you could actually make money doing that. Flower arranging, I thought that was quite sweet. Quite, quite dainty, really, isn't it? Making pictures. That's, they, they talked both about painting pictures, as in artistically. I don't think artists actually do that, but painting pictures. And also framing pictures and hanging pictures in a decorative fashion. It's other interior design taken a little bit further. Tailoring. Again, that one works. Sorry, I'm in people's way here. Tailoring. Languages and dialects. This is the foreign country bit. You know, if you go somewhere else, be able to speak the language. That's quite useful. Um, carpentry, didn't expect that, <laughs> wasn't, wasn't hanging out for carpentry, and I kid you not, code breaking. <laughs> okay, um, so now I can do five or six things, I'm trying to find my right bit here, um, I can do five or six things, I, not all of them at all, as I said earlier, was I actually trained to do. And I can earn money doing five or six different things. Not just the same thing with five or six different clients, but five or six different types of things. And the different types of things mean that I can sort of weave my way around. If this falls out here, I can think, oh, what else can I do? I can do that over there. I'm actually, as time goes on, adapting and expanding that range of things. I'm working on the principle that as I get older, I won't be able to do the 14-hour days running around the city like I do just now mentally tired half the time, working every weekend. I'm going to have to go for something that involves a lot of sitting by the time I'm 70 or 80. And so I'm already working on what could I do that's going to involve a lot of sitting and just have my mind working, hanging on here, hoping the mind's going to keep working, because that's a real problem if that stops. But you have to keep adding. You know, take a few things off the bottom and add a few things in on the top. What else could I do? Um, there's only one rule that I have about expanding the way you work and your opportunity to work and your ability to work and to find it, and that is always get paid. Now, that seems blindingly obvious, doesn't it? Put your hand up if you're rubbish asking for how much money you're worth. Me too, me too, even me working in the city, rubbish at asking for how much money I am worth. A lot of women are. You have got to be able to charge people for it. <laughs> Almost back in sex here. Um, if you can't do it, if you're really truly rubbish at asking for money, then practice first by bartering. Barter first and then work up to bucks. Um, you can do that in all sorts of ways. You can deliver something to someone for them and they give you something back. You know, we've all done that. You do something for them in order to get something for you. But this is the practice point, and it is the only rule that I have applied to my Kama Sutra of work. Learn how to do things that make people pay you money or give you stuff that you need. Because at some point, you might need it. And there's only two places to practice this entire exercise. One is when you're in work, and one is when you're out of work. You can do this anywhere. This is just simple. So what is the Kama Sutra of work? Well, for a starter, it's not missionary, and it's not in the bedroom. It's very al fresco, it's a wee bit swinging from the chandeliers. 
It's about getting you to use some of the imagery, <laughs> not all of it, some of the imagery and language of sex to say, how would that work in work? So, for instance, I want you to start identifying and practicing several things and start unpacking the Russian doll of all the talents you have because there is a wonderful George Bernard Shaw quote which I would, I would have told you if I'd known I was going to have this long but I haven't got it right in front of me and I can't remember but basically it starts with and I truly advise you to Google this afterwards this is the true joy in life and it goes on to say wear yourself out use it up use it all up find all your talents dig them up get them out get them there use them exhaust them one at a time do not die with anything unused. That's what this is about. And make it fun and make it enjoyable. Make it playful and creative. And that's why the Kama Sutra of Work idea came to me because I, I talk to lots of groups of women and I often say to them, I love working. And they all look at me like I'm bonkers. I say, well, I, I love sex. I love playfulness. I love creativity. Why can't that apply? So we'll just have a few little little of the phrases here that you can see how this rolls from sex into work so first of all what turns you on do you know what turns you on if you don't know what turns you on you might want to go and practice on your own for a bit and if you don't want to do that you might want to think back what used to turn you on because the things that used to turn you on probably still will and the things that turn you on are the things that you do well and you do easily and you spot and you notice because you notice things that flick your switches and light your fires. So find those things, pay attention to those things. There is nothing in the world that says that work should be something that is painful, that is difficult, that is, oh, I have to get up in the morning and do this thing. There is stuff that says, gee, this is orgasmically good doing this. I had a cracking day doing that thing. Find the stuff that turns you on. How are you at oral? <laughs> ask for stuff. Women don't ask for stuff very much. They don't ask to be tried out in that role. And they certainly don't say, oh, do you know how you gave him that job? I can do, I can do that. Look, me, 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 I can do that. Use that to ask for stuff. Use that to put yourself in front of people to make sure they notice that you're there. You do not have to be bolshy. I might come across as a little bit aggressive and bolshy up here. I'm not. I'm a little mouse. No, I'm not. Um, but you have to be able to speak up for yourself and to talk. And you've got to practice oral all the time. Lubrication. <laughs> Lubrication is, without a shadow of a doubt, the single thing that has made it possible for me to earn a living by doing a whole variety of different things all over the place all the time. And lubrication is the business of connecting people together. It is making the world move around you. I'm a great connector of people. Almost the first thing I do when I meet someone and they tell me what they do is I sort of do that filing, filing cabinet thing of thinking, who should they be speaking to? Who do I know they should be speaking to? And you sort of do that trans-derivational search thing you do when your eyes go off and you think, oh, I need to make sure that they meet them. And I've done that for years and I did it instinctively. It used to be my defense mechanism um, as you know, it's a bit like a cat brings a mouse into an owner. When I used to be infinitely more nervous when I met people at networking events, I thought, if I can make them happy, <laughs> they might stand around long enough to talk to me and I won't feel like such a lemon. And so that was how lubrication got started for me. So be a lubricator. Lubricate like mad because they will lubricate you right back. It might not be them and it might not be this week or this month or this year. But it will happen because, trust me, it is like karma. It just goes around. You get a reputation for it and you throw this huge bucket of energy out there of goodwill to people and it starts to flow back at you. Be of wire. Watch what other people are doing. Look and see, do you like that? If you don't know how they do it, watch how they do it. Watch how she made a success of that. Watch how she got that role. And if you don't feel brave enough to do it, fake it. We've all done that. <laughs> If you have to, fake it. Someone's already used this, but I'm going to use it again, on top or not. Some people never make a habit of getting on top. Every now and again, practice it. Practice being the person who takes a bit of leadership. Put yourself out there. Chop. I did this recently with a business where they were having a bit of a struggle, and I was theoretically, well, I'm not theoretically non-executive director. I am non-executive director, and I rang them up, and I said, you've got a bit of a problem here. 
And every time you put someone in position to run this business, you fire them after six months. I think you're getting it wrong. Why don't I do it for you for three months and see how it goes? You have to take yourself and put your neck firmly onto the chopping block and say, lop it off if I get it wrong. I mean, they might lop it off, but I'll have tried. One-to-one um, -one is brilliant. Group, you make more money in groups. Teaching one-to-one. -one. Could you be a madame? I'm being wound up now, which is fair enough. Being a madame is, can you help other people to make money? If you can make, uh, help other people to make money, you will make money. Um, I'll cut it short now and just say a little bit of cheating. Never did anyone any harm. You haven't got a headache. You aren't too tired. There's always time. Go and do something else outside of the job you're doing now. Get some practice at it. You get the drift. You understand where I'm going with this. What I can tell you is that everything that you need, you have tucked inside you. You are totally equipped to be in control and independent of a happy, successful life with everything you have now. We are independent and interdependent. So lubricate your way around and have a ball. <laughs>